Hi, I'm Peter Alsop. I'm glad you came by. This is my Songs to Chew podcast. Today we'll listen to a song I wrote back in 1981. That's 40 years ago. I recorded it on my Uniforms album. It's called Hopelessly Heterosexual. I first played this song in public at the 5th National Conference on what is now NOMAS, the National Organization of Men Against Sexism. I'd written lots of songs about gender and human sexuality, but being heterosexual myself, I really wanted to make sure that some of the humor I used in this song wasn't inadvertently stepping on anyone's toes or being politically insensitive. I even set up a workshop for after the concert so I could hear what other folks at the conference might have to say about my songs. Well, let's just say I had a very well-attended workshop. Lots of input and discussion. So, let's listen to it now, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Here's Hopelessly Heterosexual. Listen, you're one of my oldest and dearest friends, but you have to understand, you see, that, well... I'm hopelessly heterosexual. I guess I'm kind of slow. Mom and Dad were all I had, that's the only way I know. So I'm hopelessly heterosexual. I'm stuck with being straight. So man to man, I'll ask you not to ask me for a date. When I'm with you, I'm happy. When you're with me, you're gay. I love you like a brother, but not the other way. Now I'm not scared to try it, but it's not my cup of tea. I never even thought of it till you brought it up to me. And now that I consider it, I'd rather stay repressed. Cause I don't feel excited at the thought of you undressed. I'm hopelessly heterosexual. You know I'm not a tease. I'm a product of society, so don't be angry, please. I'm hopelessly heterosexual, and I hate to be a bore. But I'd rather watch the Super Bowl than sit here and explore. I'm flattered that you asked me, but that's the way it has to be. Cupid's kind of stupid. He hit you and he missed me. But since we're on the subject and you know where I stand, what exactly do you do? I guess use your hand. I mean, do you? How does? What if? Where will? From behind, oh well, I just, you know, it was, <laughs> never mind. I'm hopelessly heterosexual and I don't mean to offend, so don't hold it against me and I'll be your best friend. No, don't hold it against me and please be my best friend. Uh, can I still borrow your car tonight? What I remember most about the discussion after the concert was the amount of intense emotions that came up. It seemed to me that the conference itself had very few cisgendered folks there, what we called straight people back then. And the feedback I got varied, depending on who was giving it. Some of my men friends, who were openly gay activists, appreciated my intentions of wanting to get other heterosexual people to acknowledge our own discomfort and curiosity about homosexuality. They felt it was important to have a heterosexual man bring up these kinds of topics to my mostly heterosexual audiences, pointing up the homophobic fears and culturally learned distancing we do around our gay friends. Most of them thought the humor was helpful and would make it easier for some of the more macho guys to at least hear some of what I talk about in the segues between my songs. There were others who were still feeling raw from the concert, mostly younger men who had not yet been able to come out being gay, because of the drastic shunning and shaming that would go on in their family, their workplace, and with their, quote, friends if they revealed their secrets. There was one line in the song that I changed that originally went, I'll stay locked in the closet if you're not my opposite. Certainly not a hilarious line, but it rhymed and continued the thread of the song, and I like the flow and cleverness and sound of the internal rhymes of locked, closet, opposite, One supportive young man with tears pointed out that being locked in the closet was such a hugely painful ordeal for so many people that it just wasn't going to be funny, no matter how clever it sounded to me. And on top of that, he was hearing it from a man who was not gay, me. 
And it just felt like, even with my good intentions, my lack of consciousness and awareness about his pain was off-putting and reminiscent, once again, of all the times that straight people openly made jokes about gay people who then would have to laugh or smile in order to pass so as not to be detected. Most of the societies around this world of ours include mixtures of people with wide ranges of different qualities, appearances, behaviors, incomes, customs, and many other traits. And our human society seemed to need to classify each of us and define us and sort us by using all sorts of differentiating metrics and categories and labels. These classifications for us begin even before we're born. And we notice that some of these categories tend to include privileges for the people in that category. Privileges that other people who are not in that category don't have. These categories with privileges, they often contain the largest number of people, but not always. For example, in a country that has predominantly white people, the people who are not white usually do not have the same privileges or access to resources that most white people have. Those of us who have these privileges and entitlements just because we're in a predominant category often don't even notice them. It's like a fish swimming in the ocean who doesn't even notice the water. It's just part of what they've grown up with. But if we take that fish out of the water, then they immediately notice something is missing. I know, I know the analogy doesn't completely hold up, but you get the idea. I personally fall into categories with lots of privileges and entitlements because of my parentage and where I was born. I'm an able-bodied white male, adult, tall, right-handed, college-educated, and heterosexual. All the markings for an oppressor. Fortunately, I've had help from many, many wise women and men in my life who've helped me understand and change many of the patriarchal stories I've absorbed growing up as a man in this world. I know I have privileges in the culture I'm in, and I've learned that I don't have to accept or indulge myself with these privileges, including my heterosexual privilege. I'm so very grateful for the teachers in my life, for their generosity of time, energy, love, and guidance. Because of them, I'm now better able to avoid passing on those same old stories to my own children. I can now experience the benefits of a much wider range of emotions, and I have an emotional vocabulary that helps me stay balanced and clear about so many of the confusing messages and interpersonal interactions that us older heterosexual white men, like me, have to juggle with as we age. I've learned to sit back and listen and wait instead of pushing forward and feeling hurt when I'm not listened to. I don't need to talk and take credit for everything anymore. I'm no longer desperate to make sure everyone knows that I'm special and important. By being curious about what others have had to go through, others without the advantage of having my banker privileges, I've been able to let go of many delusions I thought I needed to survive and stay in control. That's it for today. Thanks for stopping by. I hope you feel your time has been well spent here. If so, please let your friends and family know about the Songs to Chew podcast. It's free. And I'll be back next week with another song. I'm Peter Alsop. Hope to see you then. Be safe.